Our opening thought is from a Margaret Atwood poem. And my original source said it was called Solstice Poem, but actually she has another Solstice Poem, and I was able to track down the actual title. This is called Shape Shifters in Winter. Um, and <clears throat> just a couple of very short sections. Through the slit of our open window, the wind comes in and flows around us, nothingness in motion like time, the power of what is not there. The snow empties itself down, a shadow turning to indigo, obliterating everything out there, roofs, cars, garbage cans, dead flower stalks, dog turds, it doesn't matter. You could read this as indifference on the part of the universe or else a relentless forgiveness. All of our scratches and blots and mortal wounds and patched up jobs wiped clean in the snow's huge erasure. This is the solstice, the still point of the sun, its cusp and midnight, the year's threshold and unlocking, where the past lets go of and becomes the future, the place of caught breath, the door of a vanished house left ajar. Our reading is from Maureen Kaloran. Come Christmas. No one is ever really ready for Christmas. If we were really all prepared, if every gift we had contemplated had been obtained, if every present was beautifully beribboned, if all the goodies our friends deserved were baked and cooled and stored just so, if each and every person we love was gathered for our celebration, if we never snapped at someone we care about, nor stopped short of being all that we could be. If our minds were 100% loving and our hearts were 100% generous, we truly would be ready. And truly, we would not need Christmas quite so much. So come Christmas, most needed of seasons. Come with the reminder that love does not depend on perfection, but on willingness to risk connection. Come into the unsteady manger of our hearts, that we may feel the warmth of new life and give flesh to the promise of hope that cries to bring healing into our world. Come Christmas, come love, come hope, be born in our unready hearts on that silent and holy night. Our next reading is by a poet named Naomi Shihab Nye. Um, Naomi lives in San Antonio, has spent most of her life in Texas, but she, her family uh, is Palestinian. Her father grew up there, her grandmother is still there, and she has numerous really wonderful poems about the Palestinian experience and that, um, that part of the world. And I thought, it's a good time to hear from her and hear that voice. So this is called How Palestinians Keep Warm. Choose one word and say it over and over till it builds a fire inside your mouth. Adafara the one who holds out. Alford, solitary one. The stars were named by people like us. Each night they line up on the long path between worlds. They nod and blink, no right or wrong in their yellow eyes. Dear ah, little house, unfold your walls and take us in. My well went dry, my grandfather's grapes have stopped singing. I stir the coals, my babies cry. How will I teach them they belong to the stars? They build forts of white stone and say, this is mine. How will I teach them to love Mizar, veil, cloak, 
to know that behind it an ancient man is fanning a flame. He stirs the dark wind of our breath. He says the veil will rise till they see us shining, spreading like embers on the blessed hills. Well, I made that up. I'm not so sure about Mizar. But I know we need to keep warm here on earth. And when your shawl is as thin as mine is, you tell stories. Okay, first I'm just curious. How many of you think Christmas decorations should go up as early as possible? Preferably, oh, mid-August. <laughs> Anyone? The people running the stores seem to think that. My husband came back from Home Depot in October muttering about how they had Christmas decorations up already. He said there were trees blocking the aisles. There was glitter on everything. And then the Christmas music came on and I almost ran out the door. <laughs> Tinsel always brings out the Grinch in him. Full disclosure, at our house, we celebrate Festivus for the rest of us. <laughs> um, so when do you bring out the Christmas finery at your house? Or do you? I, I have friends who adore Christmas decorations. And I love the Santa collection over here. That's fun. They love getting to spend a weekend putting up decades worth of collected doodads, greenery, lights, and yes, tinsel. It makes them happy. And it always makes me happy to visit their houses and see everything shining in the twinkle lights, especially since I don't really do any decorating at my house anymore. But Christmas time for some of us just makes us anxious or annoyed or exhausted. We get anxious that we can't live up to our family's expectations or our own. Anxious because we're not sure which traditions we have to keep, even if we personally just hate them. Anxious because our family members are not playing the roles that we so carefully assign to them. Anxious that our presents are all wrong, or we forgot someone, or the Christmas cookies are burned and the pralines came out grainy. I finally realized that my anxiety in December was not due to my tendency to burn the Christmas cookies. It came from the fact that I don't know how to celebrate the holiday when I don't believe the same things I used to. Yes, carols and colored likes can make me wistful, but not for Santa Claus and cookies. What I find myself missing is that sure belief that I had in childhood in the baby Jesus as the source of love, light, and peace. I remember when I was a kid lying in bed on Christmas Eve, picturing God choosing to put on a human body. Um, there's a great line from a David Wilcox song, if God felt a hammer in the palm of his hand. And I just love that line. If God had chosen to come to a teenaged version and her skeptical but steadfast fiance. If God had chosen to be born in the middle of a broad desert to a family with no wealth or power to give him advantage, an ordinary working family like ours. And I remember actually feeling a divine presence settle over me as I laid in my little twin bed. I would lie there visualizing hope and love flooding into the world through one tiny helpless infant. And then I remember picturing an adult Jesus in heaven smiling down on the earth, wrapping huge ghostly arms around the globe. 
And I remember that calm certainty that Jesus, through Christians like me, could truly save the world from hatred and war if we were just faithful enough. But then life happened as it does. I watched people, most of them loudly proclaiming their Christian faith, behaving, well, like humans. That is to say, both with kindness and with startling cruelty. And I behave like that too. I might have prayed on Christmas Eve for baby Jesus to bring peace to the world, but Christmas Day was likely to find me fighting fiercely with my siblings. So I question, why do people act like that? Does prayer work? Was Jesus really God incarnate, or was he a son of God in the same way that we're all children of God? So I spent many years reading sacred texts of all kinds and researching different faiths before I came across Unitarian Universalism, Buddhism, Hinduism even, Judaism, Neo-Paganism. But really, through all of that seeking, what I was trying to do was find a way to reconcile an adult intellectual understanding of the sacred with that visceral feeling of the sacred that I remembered. And for me, when I was a child, that feeling was strongest on Christmas Eve. I am grateful to have found Unitarian Universalism. It's a place where I can continue to explore, and my understanding of reality can make some crazy U-turns, but I don't have to go find a new religious community. I don't have to make up labels or cram my understanding of God and Jesus and the nature of the universe into a neat little box. That part is wonderful. But what we give up when we surrender the need for that box, is the comfort of having nice, neat boundaries. We give up the comfort of simple certainties, one answer and one savior. Even if we still sing, O come all ye faithful, our experience of it changes. So I still appreciate the meaning of Christmas, but it's a different meaning. It's more complex than God becomes baby, baby is Jesus, Jesus gets killed so humans can be forgiven for being human, and anyone who doesn't believe it is going straight to hell. So if we don't believe that, what do Unitarian Universalists, as a faith, not as individuals because goodness knows what brings us together is that (laughs) we're all making our own stuff up, right? But as as a faith, what do we believe about the meaning of Christmas? What do we agree on? Well, early Unitarians, at least one of whom was burned at the stake for heresy, believed in the unity of God, rejecting the Trinity. And that meant that Jesus' role was that of a prophet and a teacher, not a literal incarnation of deity. And our universalist forebears believed in universal salvation, one that did not require accepting Jesus as the only Savior. So most Unitarian Universalists don't believe in the divinity, or at least the unique divinity, of Jesus as the one and only Christ. That doesn't mean he's not important to us. We believe he was a prophet, Buddha, Muhammad, and other great religious teachers. But you use also believe that we have the responsibility to seek understanding and find new meaning in old traditions. And that new meaning can be just as rich and emotionally powerful as the Christmas stories we learned as children. So, for example, let's take the star, the famous star in the East that led three or four, depending on your source, astrologers to journey across the desert and offer gifts to the newborn king. Was there a star literally pointing down to somebody's barn like a neon arrow in Las Vegas? Well, we're sure there's not. 
but a comet, a supernova, a conjunction of stars so bright that people remembered it and later connected it to that vision of the birth of their new God. Margaret Gooding wrote a poem, it's in our hymnal, called Why Not a Star, in which she said, they told me that when Jesus was born, a star appeared in the heavens above the place where the young child lay. When I was very young, I had no trouble believing wondrous things. I believed in the star. It was a wonderful miracle, part of a long ago story foretelling an uncommon life. They told me a supernova appeared in the heavens in its dying burst of fire. When I was older and believed in science and reason, I believed the story of the star explained. But I found that I was unwilling to give up the star, fitting symbol for the birth of one whose uncommon life has long been remembered. The star explained became the star understood for Jesus, for Buddha, for Zarathustra. Why not a star? Some bright star shines somewhere in the heavens every time a child is born. Who knows what it may foretell? Who knows what uncommon life may yet again unfold if we but give it a chance? Some bright star shines somewhere in the heavens each time a child is born. Sophia Lyon Fawes, a renowned UU religious educator, wrote, For so the children come, and so they have been coming. No angels herald their beginnings. No prophets predict their future courses. No wise men see a star to show where to find the babe that will save humankind. Yet each night a child is born is a holy night. Each child bears within it the potential to change the world. Each one of us bears within, still, the potential to change the world. One of the changes we hope for, of course, especially this year, is for peace. All around the world, people are hoping and praying for love, peace, and goodwill to men. Those treasures shine just as brightly whether the story of Bethlehem is, for you, literal or mythical. It's why Linus quotes Luke 2 in the Charlie Brown Christmas special. You remember, it's the part where he says, Sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. What do the angels proclaim when they announce the baby Christ's birth to the shepherds? They say, on earth peace and goodwill toward men. That's the passage that Unitarian Edmund Sears was writing about when he composed the words to It Came Upon the Midnight Clear back in the 19th century. And his lyrics ring just as true to us today as they did more than 150 years ago. But with the woes of war and strife, the world has suffered long. Beneath the angel strain have rolled 2,000 years of wrong. And we who fight the wars hear not the love song which they bring. Oh, hush the noise of battle strife and hear the angels sing. And then in true Christmas spirit, Sears ends on a hopeful note. Peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors fling, and the whole world give back the song which now the angels sing. No matter how far away peace seems, no matter how much despair and hatred seem to be winning, we can always hope for the breakthrough that brings calm and love. And no matter how long and cold the night, every dark hour carries in its chill the hope of morning. That hope for a rising sun after the coldest night points us to the oldest meaning of Christmas, one that predates Christ by millennia, 
psychologically and spiritually, I think this is where the real emotional power of Christmas comes from. The winter solstice, the longest night of the year. No matter how intellectually certain we are that the sun will rise, and no matter how disconnected our electric lights and central heating allow us to be from the actual cycles of the year, somewhere deep in our reptilian hindbrain is a kernel of despair at the dwindling sun. We need to be reminded and we need to celebrate the truth that light and warmth do always return after winter, after tragedy and despair, after grieving, mourning always comes. The baby who arrives in the night, the morning sun rising low and weak in the south, both will grow to bring us warmth and joy and eventually a harvest. Candlelight services speak viscerally to our craving for the sun to return. I love to attend these services on Christmas Eve, watching the flickering light slowly grow to fill the sanctuary while we sing Silent Night. As the flames and the smiles spread across the room, as I watch mothers leaning down to kindle their children's small flames and the flickering light over faces of grandfathers and babes in arms, that's when I feel the power of Christmas all over again. Yes, as the plastic reindeer multiply on my neighbor's lawns and tacky Christmas carols blare through the grocery store, I always grow a little irritated and wistful for a simpler season. But then I remind myself of a more powerful truth. The real power of Christmas manifests when we remind each other that light and hope and love and yes, even peace are waiting in the wings. We need Christmas, even the most secular of you use. No, not the tinsel or the perfect tree not even a belief in a divine incarnation that will come and magically impose peace and love upon us. We're grown-ups now. We understand we have to do that work ourselves. But to do that work, we need hope. We need hope that morning will come, that the sun will emerge after the long darkness, hope that people can find peace with each other, hope symbolized by each sweet, squalling baby. That is what I wish for you. In this month, which can be difficult, may you find reminders of love. May you find hope that enables you to keep moving forward. May you find moments of peace, even if they're small. In a few weeks, the light will break weak and cold in the southeast but it will grow. And that, Charlie Brown, is what Christmas is all about. Amen and blessed be. Our closing thought is by UU Minister Mark Bellatini. Gray skies over my head, throw yourselves like quilts over my busy life and remind me to sit down and rest. Stars of winter, Orion sash sparkling across the heavens, remind me by your distance that, compared to the infinity of the universe, every single thing I struggle with on Earth is small, parochial, and hardly universal in scope. Great music of the season, glowing with angel songs and filigreed with great mysteries, remind me that my own birth, like the births of all the people in this room, was no less mysterious than that ancient and celebrated birth, no less brimming with wonder, for all children that come into the world have lives as precious to them as Jesus's was to him. So now come, love greater than my longing, silence greater than the fatigue of tongues, and haul my heart away from the undue frenzy of the season and bestow it to rest, proportion, 
and the haunting dark beauty of winter's long nights.